Okay, so we're now recording. Um, and so I can now introduce our speaker. Um, welcome everyone to the first philosophy speaker series talk of the year at Royal Holloway. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Luke Ruloffs. Um, Dr. Ruloffs is a postdoc right now at the Center for Mind, Brain and Consciousness at New York University. Uh, prior to this, uh, they were a postdoc at the Australian National University in Canberra, and before that, um, sorry, after that, a postdoc at the University of uh, uh, Bochum in Germany. Um, Dr. Rulofs has two books, um, both with OUP. Um, one is called Combining Minds, that came out two years ago, and the other one is on its way called Reason, Empathy, and the Minds of Others. And the talk today is entitled The Gendering of Violence and Consent, What We Can Learn from the BBC Cover-Up. Um, so without further ado, uh, please, Dr. Rolos, thanks for joining us. Great, hello everyone. Um, thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, uh, I, I should apologize if I get the interface wrong. Um, I also want to apologize uh, preemptively if there are any typos or missing slides, because this was uh, a talk assembled fairly uh, hastily I'd actually originally been going to talk about the metaphysics of consciousness in German idealism, which would have had a very different vibe, um, but that fell through for certain organizational reasons. So I have pivoted to this uh, this topic, uh, doing the kind of philosophy of how violence is constructed as a social category in relation to gender. And I'm gonna be looking at that, uh, particularly through the work of two feminist philosophers, Judith Butler, and Talia May Betcher, um, and I'll be looking at it with a particular eye towards some recent events that are uh, being hashtagged as BBC cover-up. So the plan of the talk is fairly simple. I'm going to start by offering a hopefully brief rundown of that affair, uh, the events that have happened over the last couple of weeks. I'll then try to pull out what strikes me as really philosophically interesting about um, the article at the center of that affair and a lot of the associated texts that kind of came after it in reaction to it. Um, and then I'll offer kind of theoretical analyses, uh, firstly drawn from Betcher's work and then drawn from Butler's work. Um, I should also note, uh, basically the, the entire talk is about sexual violence and transphobia. Um, so it's a pretty heavy topic and, you know, I want people to be aware of that going in. Um, okay, so I should get started particularly on trying to get in order what happened. Um, so about two weeks ago, the BBC published an article by a journalist called Caroline Lowbridge um, about a supposed problem of sexual coercion of cis lesbians by trans lesbians using trans-inclusive ideology supposedly as a, a kind of guilt trip, as a, a tool of psychological coercion. Um, it was later that day brought to public notice that one of the supposed victims in that article, um, one of the people kind of opining about the dynamics of, of consent in these situations, um, is herself a multiple sexual assaulter um, and that you know, seems relevant. Um, a few days later, there was an open letter uh, from a, uh, an activist group asking the BBC to apologize for uh, what it claimed was a, an inflammatory and under-evidenced article. The BBC refused to do that. Um, it became clear, uh, I think on November 2nd, that uh, Lowbridge was fully aware that uh, Lily Kate had assaulted multiple people before the article was published uh, and had chosen not, not only to, to continue including Cade uh, and her opinions, but also uh, to not provide in that, that information and to not even uh, admit having spoken to the person who, who told her that. Um, later that day, Cade posts a series of uh, really explicitly genocidal uh, posts about trans women. Um, literally calling for them all to be violently killed. Um, a couple of days later, the BBC kind of quietly removes Kate from the article, but keeps the rest of the article up with a little disclaimer saying, well, there was 
some some inappropriate things, but we're still kind of standing behind the basic thesis of the article. And then just a couple of days ago, the BBC announced that it's pulling out of Stonewall's diversity champion scheme, uh, saying that it's specifically because of Stonewall's uh, supposedly not impartial stance on trans inclusion, that Stonewall is uh, committed to trans inclusion. And the BBC has basically said, we no longer see that as our goal. We want to be impartial between trans inclusion and trans exclusion. Um, you know, in the course of writing this every day, I'd wake up and there'd be some something new. So there may be some further developments today that I'm not up to date with. Um, OK, so let me say a bit briefly about this article um, that, that kind of is at the center of everything. So uh, it, it's important that it, it is claiming a systemic problem. Uh, it's not claiming simply that uh, particular bad events have occurred, but that there is this general problem that there, you know, there needs to be more discussion, there needs to be something done about it. Um, and th that is, I, I take it, quite an inflammatory claim to, uh, to identify a, a vulnerable minority as uh, in the root of the systematic problem of sexual coercion. Um, so there should be a high evidential standard for that. The evidence that the article presents is, it principally is, is two things. One is uh, a survey uh, in which a survey of cis lesbians in which 56% reported being pressured or coerced to accept a trans woman as, an, as a sexual partner, um, and a collection of eight personal accounts, seven of which were anonymous, uh, one of which was, was not, and that was the decade. Um, two of those accounts, uh, two of the anonymous ones, describe uh, sexual assault. Um, like they, they describe situations where uh, a woman was sexually assaulted by uh, someone who was trans, and uh, obviously that is a very serious and bad thing. But the majority of the accounts aren't actually describing that. What they're describing is uh, essentially is, is criticism, uh, being accused of transphobia or being uh, excluded from LGBT groups, um, or the, uh, fearing criticism like that and kind of internalizing it uh, and making sexual choices on that basis. And one of those was Cade's account uh, in which he essentially said, I uh, refused to uh, shoot porn scenes that featured a trans woman um, and I was criticized on the internet for being transphobic. Um, so the the problems that the, the open letter I, I mentioned earlier claim with this. So two big problems. One is that the, the numbers here are just very small. Um, the survey covered 80 people. Um, so, you know, th this is, and, and I should clarify that the, the personal accounts, uh, the majority of them come from respondents to that survey. Um, so th this, you know, this really isn't looking at like a large scale cross section of the population. So the claim that there's a systematic problem is, is really going beyond what this small sample can indicate. Moreover, um, the survey's participants were all self-selected and they were uh, responding to the survey uh, shared by an explicitly trans group called Get the L Out. Um, and you know, to, pl to put it bluntly, uh, there's relatively little evidential value in the fact that you can get 56% of the visitors to uh, an explicitly anti-trans website to say, yes, I feel that I've been uh, coerced by trans people like that. It is precisely the people who have that perception who will go to that website. So this is absolutely not a, a representative or random sample. Um, and I want to be very clear here that I do not intend to question the events reported in any of these accounts. I think uh, th these people should be absolutely accepted as accurately reporting the events that happened. Uh, however, that doesn't require trusting their interpretation of others' motives. As I said, the majority of these personal accounts um, are something along the lines of, I was criticized and attacked simply for saying blah, blah, blah. 
or simply for doing such and such, or simply for refusing a certain person's advances. And whenever someone says, oh, I was subjected to criticism simply for the following, and then they present a very innocuous interpretation of what they supposedly did, um, I think it's reasonable to be suspicious and to, to consider the possibility that the people who, who were criticizing them were actually responding to something else that they did, something else that they said, something else that they implied in context. Um, and as, as we'll see, I think there's actually very strong evidence that uh, many of the people responding to the survey uh, did and said lots of things that uh, that go beyond simply refusing a particular person as a sexual partner. Um, okay, so who's Lily Cade? So Lily Cade is a lesbian porn performer and producer, and she's the only named person who is describing a personal experience in that article. There are other named people who are there to give their opinion, spokes, uh, spokesperson for Stonewall, uh, various, you know, trans or cis uh, advocates and activists, but in terms of personal accounts, the only one where we can uh, identify who was involved and even begin to uh, look at you know, other people's side of the story is Cade. Um, as I said, she describes an experience in which she uh, refused to shoot porn scenes with uh, a trans woman performer and refused to market it through her uh, very specifically a lesbian porn label. And she claims was then criticized as a result of that. So as as came out, she has been publicly accused by four named uh, cis women of assaulting them at events in the in the porn scene. Um, I mean, that's four people who have publicly said this and put their name to it, but all of them have said this was a systematic problem. The Likade does this a lot. Um, and she has not disputed those accounts. She has publicly apologized, but admitted that they were actually accurate. Um, and shortly after this article was published, she published a bunch of these calls for, as she puts it, uh, the pussified men of America to rise up and say enough is enough. And in her words, to lynch a list of famous named trans women. Um, so Lily Cade, of course, is one individual. But these revelations about her, I think, really underline those two basic problems of the article. I think, you know, it, it's not just that by removing her, you keep the article's thrust and point uh, strong. She's kind of illustrating what's wrong with the whole, whole thing. Um, so firstly, in terms of numbers, uh, Lily Cade is individually responsible for more sexual assaults than Caroline Lowbridge could find in a year of looking for examples. So, you know, obviously that doesn't show a systematic problem. Obviously, it would be deeply homophobic to say, well, what Lily Cade did is showing like a national news story level of, of significance to a, a general problem with cis lesbians. But equally, uh, I think that should underline that it's inappropriate to make that kind of claim about trans lesbians. Um, Second, it illustrates the, the issue of trusting people's interpretations of other people's motives. So most of the other accounts revolve around uh, the, the, the crucial idea that people are facing unwarranted accusations of transphobia, that just for refusing to go on a date with this particular trans person, uh, just for you know, acting on my preferences, I was being accused of transphobia, I was being excluded from local LGBT groups. Um, and in the, the one case where we can actually evaluate whether there was anything else that might have warranted those accusations, uh, Cade is saying literally the most transphobic thing you could imagine someone saying, kill them all. Um, so, I, and I, again, I think that really underlines that th this is not sufficient evidence. Like we don't, we're not in an epistemic position where we can responsibly publish an article like this. Um, OK, so I'm going to try and do some philosophy with all of this stuff. Um, I think there's a, a bunch of messed up stuff has happened, and I'm going to try to shed some light, uh, if possible, with, with my professional 
tools. And in particular, I want to pull on a thread that appears at multiple places and times in this affair. Um, and that is perceptions of violence, of what is or is not violent, that turn more on who is involved and what is being done and how things are classified than on the, the act of consenting, the act of, of making a free choice by individuals involved. And as I say, I think this, this is kind of the, to me, this was like kind of the master key linking uh, a whole bunch of themes here. Um, so the first strand of this thread um, is that the BBC article puts cases of assault and coercion alongside disputes about definitions as though they are all equivalent or connected. So a couple of, of quotes, um, lesbians are being pressured to accept the idea that a penis can be a female sex organ. Um, you know, whatever you think of that claim, whether you think it's, it, that, that a penis can be a female sex organ, whether you think that's true or false, um, you know, right or wrong, whether you think it's transphobic to deny that or not, it's clearly not a claim about any individual's actions. It's a claim about how to categorize the bodies of a whole section of, of people. It's just a different thing than individuals making their personal choices. Um, likewise, there was discussion of whether this claim is transphobic, uh, that lesbians don't date trans women because they are literally lesbians and they're attracted to women, not men. And so again, this is not just saying, I'm not attracted to you. This is saying, the reason I'm not attracted to you is that you're not a woman. It's making, in a sense, my attraction an arbiter of someone else's uh, gender. And the, the group who organized the survey, Get the L Out, they're reporting that the survey does this even more clearly. So they, they report, you know, as an instance of coercion, that someone was banned from their LGBT group for stating that lesbians don't like penises or have sex with people who have or had penises. You know, which is not just a claim about this individual's preferences or practices, this is them attempting to define what lesbians in general, including presumably other lesbians in that group, um, do or don't like. Likewise, uh, people are routinely being harassed, the group claims, for stating that their sexuality um, excludes males regardless of their gender identity. Not just, I'm not attracted to you, but my status as attracted to women excludes you know, this whole section of people. Um, and sometimes get the L out explicitly connects disputes over spaces, groups and definitions with the subjective experience of coercion. Um, they say on dating sites, many women experience a presence of trans women as a violation. Um, they say, most respondents reported being subjected to rhetoric about what lesbianism means um, directly or indirectly and have experienced it as a form of psychological coercion. And I think this is really, like in some ways, really revealing um, because like, obviously I want to be sympathetic to people feeling violated and coerced. But, you know, if this is true, then if these, if these statements are true, then people's feelings of violation and coercion in some of these cases are not tracking anything that's being done directly to them. Um, so for instance, rhetoric about what lesbianism means uh, might well mean that some other person was saying, I'm a lesbian and here's my trans girlfriend. I'm attracted to her and she's a woman. And the, the person who filled out the surveys is, is effectively saying, I experienced this as a form of psychological coercion as an attack on me. And this in turn means that when the, the article and the survey and get the L out talk about how many people are feeling coerced and feeling violated, you have to keep in mind, you know, that includes effectively them finding it violating and coercive just to have trans people in their spaces, um, in their groups. Um, and they include a famous quote uh, from a, a book from the 70s called The Transsexual Empire. Um, where the author Janice Raymond says, all transsexuals rape women's bodies by reducing the real female form to an artifact and appropriating this body for themselves. And, you know, if you hold to what I would kind of think of as the, the mainstream understanding of 
of what rape is, that sees it fundamentally as an act of violence done to an individual against their will, then it, I think it has to seem inappropriate to apply that to an abstraction and to talk about raping the abstract concept of, of women's bodies because you know abstract abstractions can't consent and can't be the targets of violence um, and trying to say you know I while I was reading the article I thought of this quote um, which is from a kind of founding text of trans exclusionary strains of feminism I you know I, I was planning to include it in this talk even before I saw that it was explicitly being quoted in this group's material, um, which kind of increased my confidence that I was pulling on an important thread. Okay, the second strand of that thread is not just that all of these things are seen as violence, there's also the strand of which things were not seen as violence. So um, in her public apology, this is uh, four years ago now, um, after multiple accusations of sexual assault, Kate, Kate says, I didn't conceptualize any of what I was doing at the salt. I thought I was so good at reading people that I could tell when girls wanted it. I thought I was better than porn's serial gropers, but I guess I was just the female of the species. Um, interestingly, even a few years before that, she had been publicly posting things like, uh, in response to a, a question on her Tumblr, I used to get off on convincing girls who normally use barriers to forgo them. Uh, even though I dealt with complications from multiple strains of HPV, some of them severe, I just saw it as both normal and worth it to essentially to, to pressure people into not using forms of protection that they would normally use. Um, and she basically says, I don't think that lesbian sex is dangerous enough for protection to be called for. And I just, I just find it, I just find this really striking. Um, but this is someone who, well, as I say, yeah, who, who admits that they get off on overcoming people's boundaries, who, who enjoys that sense of pushing people and of kind of conquering or achieving something, but will also angrily denounce others for doing so, is, you know, is speaking to this journalist for an article about supposed coercion, um, talks in one of her Tumblr posts about uh, you know, punching men at porn events for their inappropriate behavior. Um, so there's, there's this disconnect that is really interesting to me. Um, and as, so, you know, one question is how to reconstruct this individual's thought process. But a more important question maybe is what thought process led Caroline Lowbridge and everyone else at the BBC headquarters who, you know, who approved the article and is now continuing to defend the article to decide that this is all irrelevant, that this, that this isn't even important context. Um, you know, that all of the things they do include are important parts of the, the story they're telling, but all of but everything that Kate says isn't. Um, and so here's, here's one data point. A lot of online uh, responses on Twitter when this was being discussed jumped immediately to saying essentially women can't rape. So here's, here's four examples um, responding to a particular person posting about this. Saying, look, UK law requires a penis to rape. Um, what, what Kay did is merely sexual assault. Um, you know, setting aside that those are explicitly stipulated, as I understand it, to be equally serious crimes, setting aside that that distinction is drawn only in UK law and everything Kate is describing happened in California. Um, it is still striking to me that the people are jumping out here to say if it's done by a woman, it doesn't matter as much. Um, and like this is not a charitable reading, but one reading of, of why Cade and Lobert and the BBC regard Cade's behavior as, you know, at first Cade regarded it as consensual and fine, and later on all these people still regarded it as not important enough to include. Um, is that potentially that they see violations of consent by AFAB people, like people they perceive as women, um, as being less serious. And that connects uh, to the third thread that I want to talk about, which is that in Cade's posts, um, where she 
but she says a bunch of, you know, wildly transphobic stuff. She repeatedly frames voluntary acts as a, a matter undergoing violence when those acts are done voluntarily by AFAP people. Um, and I'm going to provide some quotes. I want to yeah, add a, a second content warning because uh, the quotes are quite graphic. Um, but here they go. Um, she says, the trans women will take all your girls and break them and turn them inside out and cut their tits off. Um, she says, to break me and others like me, they raped and groomed and tortured and sliced up and desecrated and educated your daughters. She says, these pedophiles are fucking your children in public. Um, and so, so, you know, a couple of these are explicitly referring to uh, removal of breasts, so clearly talking about trans men having top surgery. Um, they're all focused on, you know, your, your girls or your daughters or more broadly your children. So there is this, this focusing on something that AFAB people are doing, which, you know, they generally have to do only after they've taken, you know, several years to persuade the medical system to, to do it. This is not being done to them. Like when trans men have top surgery, that's, that's their choice. That's something they have to fight to do. But in Cade's mind, this is done to them by trans women. There's a, a particularly ugly passage where she talks about a video with a, a trans couple trying to breastfeed a baby. And she describes the trans mother as a worthless masturbating paedophile fucking a baby while the traumatized child. So yeah, so just let me just pause. The, the mother breastfeeding is a paedophile fucking a baby. The husband, um, an adult trans, uh, trans masculine non-binary person, she describes as the traumatized child your garbage society has groomed to let pump his seed into her fertile womb, coddling his weakness and letting it happen. So even though they're, they're both adults and they've both been equally involved in this whole process, one of them is committing sexual violence and the other is a traumatized child that has been groomed by society. So, you know, it, it seems like she's really laying it out very clearly that she's trying to see uh, trans women or basically anyone assigned male at birth um, as violators. Even breastfeeding an infant can be seen as a, an act of sexual violence, um, while a trans man, and by extension, anyone assigned female at birth is being infantilized as a victim. Um, so you might think maybe this is just the inside of Cade's weird mind, but Cade is, is not at all alone in this. Um, here are some sample online uh, social media responses. People say, I agree with the overall message, but not how she said it. Um, someone says she's a Valerie Solanas for her age. I feel like feminism is back. I just love her righteous fury. Cage's wife tweeted this interesting conjunction. She says, she's extremely mentally ill and all of you trying to make hay out of it are misogynist monsters. But she's still telling the truth. And then Cade herself later on hosts a, a kind of non-apology where she says, I was in a manic episode. Um, you know, I was going off the rails but she still endorses the basic claims. So she says variations on basic, or like this, this particular extract I've got here, I don't want them to die, she says, but they are men with a mental illness that's been fed by porn. So, you know, the, the original posts were saying they're monsters, they should die. Now she's just saying, well, they shouldn't die even though they're monsters. So the, the underlying picture of the world is basically not being retracted, even while she says, don't pay attention to this thing I said. Um, and I think we can detect the same pattern in more genteel media representations, where trans women are always latently a threat and trans men are always latently victims. Um, so one recent example is this book by Abigail Schreer called Irreversible Damage, supposedly about the transgender craze seducing our daughters. 
So, you know, trans women get articles in the BBC about how uh, they're predatory and coercive and a threat. Trans men are delicate children with a, a hole carved into them. Um, OK, so the, the three strands of this threat, just to kind of draw them together, um, that a sense of personal violation is being extended not just to people's choices about their own body, but to having their definitions and their spaces and their groups and their ideas about who should be where and who should be a member of what category. Um, th those are seen as, as uh, something they're so invested in that it's a personal violation to, to be contradicted. Um, we're also observing that a cis woman's sexual assault was by her and to some extent by others seen as as n either not violent or not as violent um, as if it was done presum presumably by someone AMAB. Um, and then we're also seeing that you know, entirely voluntary decisions are construed as violence when the person making the decision is a trans man. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to apply some theory to this now. To draw on uh, some work by Talia May Betcher. She describes gender as moral sex. Um, that is, it's a matter of the social construction of certain moral boundaries which are involved in the constitution of the sex body and of personhood itself. Um, so let me break this into what I see as four key points for our purposes. First is the idea that social personhood is constructed by boundaries imposed on the body. So she puts it by saying we live in a moral order constituted through boundaries governing privacy and decency, a system that helps constitute the very line between public and private. And personhood is defined through such boundaries. So the, the thought is that for me to you know, be a, a member of society, a recognized person, is for me to be seen as having both a public face that can move through public spaces and also a distinct private side, a personal life um, that is not to be shared. And Betcher claims, you know, this is in large part constructed through a certain way of, of distinguishing you know, the body parts that I can display in public or that other people can look at uh, and the other body parts that I, I have to keep private and that other people should not look at. Um, the second point she makes is that the way these boundaries work is highly gendered. Um, okay, I might have missed out a quote here. As I said, a hastily assembled um, slides. But so she, she notes that uh, the structure of the female gendered body has uh, layers of, of privacy to it, particularly on the chest, that the construction of the male body doesn't in what she calls Eurocentered culture. So there are well, lots of cultures in the world where the chest is a public body part, um, but in Eurocentered culture, it's essentially public for those seen as men, but not for those seen as women. Um, third, she identifies how the gendered nature of the boundaries also affects the significance of transgressions of them. Um, so Becher says, rape is canonically conceptualized as male to female, through the constitution of male genitalia as violating and female genitalia as violated. This is reflected in cultural ideology that sex with men harms or dirties women. Um, so the, you know, the, the two different sets of genitals are constructed as having different kind of moral or proto-moral significance. She adds also that this asymmetry is manifested in privacy and, privacy and decency violations. Um, a man viewing the naked body of a woman will be by default seen as, as a, a violation of her privacy. By contrast, exposure of his body by default constitutes an, another violation of her rather than a violation by her of him. Um, the fourth point, and this is something that Betcher's paper doesn't delve into as much as I think it could, um, this structure of what Betcher is calling the pre-consensual violations, the picture of like what is by default uh, a moral invasion, 
influences how actual violations of consent are perceived. So she notes uh, in a footnote to that, that previous quote, um, this doesn't mean that a male cannot have his bodily privacy violated by a female or that a female cannot violate a male for decency offense. Um, such violations concern the non-consensual violation of boundaries, whereas my point concerns free consensual violations. But she says the former is shaded by the asymmetry in the latter. So what I take her to be saying is, um, you know, we, we can recognize that you know, non-consensual touching of the genitals, say, is a, you know, we, we can recognize that as a type of violation whoever does it and whoever it's done to. But there is likely to be this tendency where because we see contact with a penis as as a violation of the person who makes contact, um, if a woman gropes a man, there's going to be this kind of against the grain character to how we perceive that violation of consent. It will make it seem less uh, serious, whereas uh, a man groping a woman is liable to seem more serious because the, the actual violation of consent is layered onto uh, a matching uh, picture of the pre-consensual violations. Um, I want to go beyond what Betcher says and add the idea that there's variation among individuals and communities in how powerful this shading is. So at one extreme, what I think I've been calling the, the official liberal view is that consent is what matters regardless of who or what. Um, so, you know, sexual violence is fundamentally an interaction between basically genderless, autonomous people. It's a matter of one individual violating the autonomy of another, and gender doesn't essentially enter into that. At the opposite extreme, though, if, if one sees the, the consensual and non-consensual as, as overwhelmingly shaded, by what Betcher calls the pre-consensual, um, one might see the moral valence of actions determined primarily or exclusively by the moral sex, that is the gender of the people involved. And then you would end up with precisely this picture where anyone who is assigned male at birth, anyone who is seen as a man, uh, is also seen latently as a threat and as, as violating uh, whoever they make contact with. Whereas anyone who is assigned female at birth is seen as always latently a victim, always vulnerable. Um, okay. Oh yeah, and and uh, Betcher mentions Raymond's uh, claim that I that I that was quoted earlier. All transsexuals rape the real female form. Betcher analyzes this as positioning a, a particular person's male moral structure, their socially constructed uh, manhood as an agent of violence against their own materially female body. And Betcher observes Raymond's feminist or supposedly feminist view is ironically dependent upon the highly heterosexist system of intimacy that lies at the basis of our society's natural attitude about sex. So essentially, Betcher is saying, you know, Raymond claims to be a radical feminist fighting the, the gender system of our society, but she's actually deeply invested in it. OK, let me, uh, I hope I have time for uh, the final section, which is about Judith Butler and materialization. So Betcher's analysis is all about uh, what gets socially constructed onto the biological body, the way that society kind of writes on top of the material reality. One thing that's really striking about a lot of the, the text here is how insistently the people involved say that they don't care about that. They only care about biological sex, not social gender. So for instance, right at the beginning of the BBC article, um, there's a quote from someone given the, the pseudonym Jenny. I just don't possess the capacity to be sexually attracted to people who are biologically male, regardless of how they identify. So there's, there's a contrast being drawn between the, you know, the unchangeable facts of biology and the social construction of identity. Um, I think Judith Butler's uh, work uh, um, on construction and materialization provides a really good model for what's going on here. Um, 
in particular, uh, they say that biological sex, al although I think they, they kind of grant that it's a material reality in some sense, they say it is materialized by social structures, including language. Um, and this, this claim is in some ways inverting the usual picture where sex is this pre-social biological thing and then gender is society kind of writing on top of it, it's saying no, biological sex is, is in some way the shadow of language. Um, now, this is a claim that often promotes, often prompts perplexity, particularly in analytic philosophers. So I'm going to read a, a long quote where Butler talks about the reactions they sometimes get. Um, they say, look, certain formulations of my radical constructivist position appear almost compulsively to produce a moment of recurrent exasperation. For it seems that the constructivist refutes the reality of bodies, the relevance of science, the alleged facts of birth, aging, illness, and death, the critic might seek assurances that this abstracted theorist will admit that there are minimally sexually differentiated parts, activities, capacities, hormonal and chromosomal differences that can be conceded without reference to construction. Isn't there a physical reality here, you know, setting aside social construction? And Butler says, although at this moment I want to offer an absolute reassurance to my interlocutor, I want to say, yes, of course, I know that there are hormones and chromosomes and so on. Some anxiety prevails. To concede the undeniability of sex or its materiality um, is always to concede some version of sex, some formation of materiality. It's the discourse in and through which that concession occurs. And yes, that concession invariably does occur, not its self-formative of the very phenomenon that it concedes. So I take it they're saying here, like, yes, I will concede that there are hormones and chromosomes and so on, but the discourse through which that concession occurs, the conversation we're having right now is part of forming this, the, the phenomenon that we're talking about. Um, so they, they elaborate on this a little bit. Here's what seems to me really the key claim. The linguistic capacity to refer to sex bodies is not denied by the radical constructivist, but the meaning of referentiality is altered. In philosophical terms, the constative claim, that is the, the claim that is true or false, that is factual and descriptive, is always to some degree performative. It's always doing something. It's always accomplishing some, some act. Um, so my reading of this, and I, I should stress that I, uh, I, I've, only really come to Butler's work in a, in a committed way quite recently. So I, you know, this is not an authoritative reading, but, but my reading is Butler's saying here, yes, you can talk about what's outside social construction, but in talking about it, you're doing social construction. You are constructing. And that constructing you're doing is important. And when you say, I'm talking about what's outside social construction, you're trying to kind of obscure the constructing that you're doing. And I think that the uh, the texts we've been looking at, the BBC cover-up affair, is a really good illustration of this. Um, because in the article and in the, these related documents, you constantly see the, the language of biology being used to specify the target of sexual attraction. Um, specifically the target of, of lesbian attraction, but presumably this is meant to extend to heterosexual uh, gay male and other sorts of sexual attraction. Um, and there is something initially plausible about thinking attraction is going to be focused on the biological reality because, you know, we're into the way that people look and feel and smell and sound. This, this is something that seems like it's quite raw and physical and not constructed. Um, but the seams start showing really quickly. So let me go through a couple of quick examples. The BBC article contains this, this anecdote, this account where uh, someone with the pseudonym Amy says, I know there is zero possibility for me to be attracted to this person um, that was being discussed. I can hear their male vocal cords. I can see the male jawline. I know under their clothes there's male genitalia. These are physical realities that as a woman who likes women, you can't just ignore. The next line though is, Amy said she would feel this way even if a trans woman had undergone genital surgery. So 
you know, the presence of male genitalia is a physical reality that cannot be ignored. And yet it would still remain after that physical reality was, was gone, had been surgically reconfigured. Amy is not asked uh, how she would feel if the person in question had facial feminization surgery that changed their jawline or, or vocal feminization surgery that changed their vocal cords, um, or if a trans woman had gone through a, an estrogen dominant puberty and so had uh, female typical vocal cords and jawline. But somehow I, I kind of doubt that she would say, yes, that's what would make the difference. Seems like what she's really saying is these physical realities I can't ignore, but I would still not be able to ignore them even if they weren't here. There's also some discussion in the article of uh, an incident involving Billy Cade where she, kind of the, the thing that she's there being, being quoted about, she says she was asked to do a scene with uh, a trans woman in Toronto and initially agreed after looking at photos, after you know, seeing the physical reality after that raw sensory contact but she backed out after discovering online that she was a trans woman. That is, she backed out uh, based on you know, learning some propositional knowledge, not based on the, the experience of attraction through the senses. She says this slightly strangely phrased thing, my sex drive is oriented towards women. I couldn't see past the fact that what I was interacting with was male genitalia altered by surgery and not the reproductive organ of a female ape. And again, I'm really struck by the, the juxtaposition of this language of reproductive organs of female apes that is really trying to play up the theme of biological concreteness and physical reality. But what matters is actually not how these organs look or, or feel or present to the senses, it's knowledge about their medical histories, knowledge of how they came to be the way that they are. Um, Okay, yeah. Here's another quote from Dennis Raymond. Um, Transsexuals merely cut off the most obvious means of invading women so that they seem non-invasive. Their whole presence becomes a member invading women's space. Again, like you, you see this, this beginning with like, oh, that's the biological material realities of penises. They're physically different from vaginas and other genital configurations. And yet, this physical reality can be perceived in the whole body of a person who doesn't have a penis. Uh, and the, the last example, just to ram the point home, uh, get out the L, they repeatedly use this phrasing. So I get the L out, not get out the L. Talk about defining lesbianism as same sex attraction at the exclusion of people who have or had penises. So they say lesbians don't like penises or have sex with people who have or had Penises. So they're, they're saying this is not social construction, this is biological reality. The biological category we're talking about is people who now have or ever had penises. And this is not like the simplest or most obvious definition. Like just to put it in, you know, a quadrant, you could, you know, if you, you could have a person who had a penis and always did, person who has a penis but used to not, for instance, a post-operative trans man, a person who doesn't now have a penis but used to, such as a post-operative trans woman, um, or a person who doesn't have a penis and never had a penis. And get out the L are saying lesbians are into the, this one square, the green square, and they are not interested in any of the other three. And the biology does not dictate that. The biology is equally compatible with saying lesbian attraction is to, you know, all the people who now don't have a penis, um, regardless of what they had in the past, or saying lesbian attraction is to people who, uh, you know, were born without a penis or, or grew up without a penis, whatever their current genital configuration, or with saying lesbianism is attraction to people who, you could say to people who now have or have had a vagina, like you might not let the penis define things. You also might, uh, you know, make other divisions like the, the physical difference between uh, 
cis men's penises and trans women's penises that have been affected by hormone therapy, you might say, well, that that is a biological difference that we're going to make relevant to how we define lesbian desire. All of these decisions about which biological differences to treat as relevant are coming from somewhere other than the biological fact. Um, and I think this is essentially what Butler is saying. Even if the things referred to are not socially constructed, um, the act of grouping them is an act of social construction. Even if you know, all of the, the genital organs involved are physical realities, by grouping them in a certain way, you're socially constructing their significance um, through a kind of performative language you know, it, it, that presents itself as merely constructive, merely stating facts, but is in fact serving to construct social reality by elevating the importance of some boundaries and uh, smothering that of others. And it's an especially powerful sort of social construction, I think Butler would say, um, because it positioned itself as prior to social construction. It allows these people to say, you know, how someone identifies or what transition someone goes through, all of that is irrelevant. My attraction is free social, it's biological, it's it's more basic than this. Um, okay, so I'm, uh, in conclusion, and I hope that I haven't gone over my time, uh, I think we can't understand these recent events without attending to the systematically distorted perceptions of violence that run through them, that elevate some uh, arguably nonviolent acts into violence, uh, both like acts of disputing a category definition and voluntary surgical uh, procedures that people you know, seek to have done on themselves, um, while also minimizing the violence of actively intimate but non-consensual uh, activities. Um, and the, the, the connecting thread is that these perceptions systematically track perceived gender uh, and the way that that is being defined more than they track the consent given by individuals. Um, and I think this can be illuminated by looking at Betcher's account of gender as moral sex, on which gender constitutively involves constructing differential schemes of pre-consensual violations onto the body, um, but also is illuminated by Butler's account of sex as something materialized, because appeals to biological reality are engaged in social construction through their taxonomic decisions, um, even while they position their construction as prior to all other constructions because they try to position it as not constructed. Um, okay, so that is my talk, and I'm going to hopefully uh, stop sharing my screen now. I believe I have. Um, but I'm